Hello, this is Belkwell from SoupWeb.Zone, and welcome to my Pleasure Dome. Today we are reviewing Doris Lessing's novel, The Golden Notebook. Once again, this is a fairly divisive book. Some people love it, many people hate it, and most people do not care one way or the other, which makes it the perfect candidate for the second episode of Balkwell's books. Uh, you may have heard of this book, you may even have read this book, however you have never watched a YouTube video in which I talk about this book, unless you are watching this for a second time. That's the tagline. So what is it that makes this book divisive, and what is it that makes this book interesting? Well, uh, to summarize the structure of the book, it is five books in one, essentially. There is a main novella titled Free Women, and then there is there are four notebooks that are journals written by one of the characters in Free Women. And so you will read a passage from Free Women, then a passage from each of the four notebooks, Back to Free Women, Rinse, Repeat. Eventually, there's a golden notebook, um, which is what the whole thing is named after. I don't know. that It's really not a very substantial notebook, so it seems kind of strange that the book's named after it, but uh, oh well. Um, so some of the topics discussed in the book, uh, well, England in the 1950s is the setting. Uh Lots of discussion of relationships between men and women. This is known as a feminist work. Uh, idealism and politics. And the creation of works of art. So when you first look at this book and the way it is structured, you would might imagine that the notebooks are supplementary materials for the novella Free Women. That is kind of how the book is presented. Free Women is sort of a third-person narrated novella, and then these no notebooks are journals written by one of the characters. So, which character are they written by? Well, this is interesting. So, in Free Women, we have this woman named Molly, and Molly is a sort of bohemian, free-spirited woman, a communist. She works as an actor in the theater. Her ex-husband is named Richard. They've been split up for a long time. He is a straight-laced businessman, very successful businessman, and they have a son. Their son is named Tommy, and he is in his early 20s and does not know what to do with himself. Obviously, Richard, her ex-husband, would like him to be a practical man and Molly sort of wants Tommy to do whatever the heck he wants, and Tommy just sort of sits around doing not much of anything at all. We are introduced these to these characters uh, with a, by a conversation between Molly and her friend Anna, and then during this conversation, Richard and Tommy both show up. We learn some things. We learn what's going on. Boop, boop, ba -doop. Uh, the The funny thing is, though, that these diaries are not written by Molly, Richard, or nor Tommy, but are written by Anna, who is not directly involved in these conflicts, is sort of a bystander. She, t she knows them all, she talks to them all, but she's not a major factor in the story Free Women, which sort of <laughs> brings up the question of why are we reading these diaries of Anna when she's not that important to the story? So the key sort of inversion of this book is that, or the way to look at it to avoid going nuts and hating the book, well, you might hate the book either way, but it, instead of asking, instead of the diaries and journals being a supplement for the novella Free Women, uh, instead, free women and the diaries are all together sort of a character study of Anna. So the question 
is not what's going on in free women, but instead the question is what is going on with Anna? This is my famous segment where I ask what is going on and then I answer myself. <clears throat> so Anna, she is a woman <laughs> in a similar situation as Molly. She never got married, but she has an ex-boyfriend, etc. The, the main thing about Anna is that she compartmentalizes her self. She doesn't have a very strong sense of who she is. She only thinks of herself as a combination of these various sort of external aspects. Um, one of these is herself as a mother. She has a young daughter. Another of these is herself as a lover of men. She has a series of relationships with men. Another is as a communist. And the final is one is her as a novelist. She's written a novel uh, that did quite well, and then she is struggling to write more. So the way she chooses to represent these uh, sort of different aspects of herself is she writes in uh, different notebooks. These notebooks are each colored and, you know, color-coded notebooks for different aspects of her, her life. Um, in this way, the, the story of the Golden Notebook is not told in a linear fashion with a plot per se. Instead, we are basically reading through someone's diaries. And we are reading not through a chronological diary, but through just a sort of mess of random miscategorized entries. The way that we learn about Anna is by reading about Anna failing to understand herself. And by looking at these failures and living through them with her, we uh, end up getting a perspective of what what is going on, why does she feel the way she does, etc., etc. Anna sort of describes herself as a free woman, however she is very hemmed in by the society she lives in and we read about her making many of the same mistakes over and over partly because of her situation and partly because of her own you know quabble quabbles as a person her own quabbles is uh, how we'll describe that because of this uh, fact that we are reading journals of a person who keeps who has particular topics that they keep thinking about over and over and keeps making similar mistakes over and over the book becomes quite repetitive and messy and honestly quite a slog to read for the most part um at the end of the book you do get a sense that it does all fit together Though while you're reading it, it feels quite aimless. And I'll get more into this a bit later, but first I will cover the notebooks themselves. So we'll begin with the least substantial by far. I should mention, uh, the, the Free Women novella is only about 150 pages of this book that is 600 pages long, which is why it's very difficult to think of it as the main section. These notebooks are the main thing. They're, they're most of the book. The red notebook is the one we're talking about first. I had props and I forgot to bring them to my desk, so I assume you know the color red. Imagine a notebook that is this color. Uh, the red notebook is only about 30 pages overall across all the four sections, and it is about Anna's relationship with the Communist Party of Britain at the time. Um, basically, these sort of experiences and the insights she gains from them are not particularly new now. Maybe at the time they would have been more interesting. Um, basically, it's all about bureaucracy, infighting within the Communist Party. Um, at one, uh, during the book, Stalin dies, and then people learn about all the things that Stalin was doing, 
and so they have to argue with each other about whether we're still going to follow the USSR, etc., etc. From a historical perspective, this is somewhat interesting, and it ties into a certain theme that I'll talk about with the next notebook. By itself, it is really nothing at all, and honestly doesn't have much of a place uh, in the book. So I'm going to stop talking about it because I don't want to waste your time. So that, now let's move on to chronologically the first notebook, which is the Black Notebook. The Black Notebook shows up. So we start the book with 35 pages of free women, and then we get the Black Notebook, and it's 80 pages of the Black Notebook. And what we get is sort of a standalone piece of fiction about Anna... Um, as a early 20s, in her early 20s, she's living in southern Rhodesia, which is a British colony in Africa that uh, occupies the territory that is now known as Zimbabwe. Um, excuse me. This is actually quite a good standalone story. It features... The reason why this is probably the best part of the book is because Anna just sits back and we are treated to an actual piece of traditional sort of literature. We have a group of six characters. They're all uh, members of the Communist Party. Or they're sort of a communist group in Rhodesia, all white, um, all from Britain. Most of them are part of the, uh, there's an RAF base there. And these characters have, you know, interpersonal struggles with each other, they have sexual tension, they have arguments, uh, there is a series of events that leads to a thrilling and emotionally uh, involving conclusion. Uh, it's quite a good story, and it really captures this sort of youthful feeling like, all these characters feel true to being young people. They're idealistic in that they're, they're, you know, involved in this communist project in Rhodesia to attempt to, you know, revolutionize the indigenous black population and throw off the white yoke. Uh, it's, they sort of understand, however, that what they're actually doing is just getting a group of six white people and talking about it. So there's sort of this ironic detachment that they have that is sort of a precursor to the cynicism and disillusionment that is in the Red Notebook and throughout the rest of the book when it comes to discussing communism and sort of idealism and politics in general. So, yeah, this is a very good standalone story. And... It's interesting that it's placed right at the beginning of the book because it obviously it throws the pacing off completely because you, you're you reading about this free women's story for a little bit and then suddenly there's seven different new characters doing something on the other side of the world. Looking back now, having read the book, I understand that the author wants us to know this story at the beginning so that it can inform our knowledge about Anna later, but reading it for the first time, it seems completely jarring. Next we have the Yellow Notebook. The Yellow Notebook is the worst notebook. It's probably the worst notebook I've ever read, to be honest. I mean, of all the notebooks that I'm going around reading. The Yellow Notebook um, is Anna's attempts at fiction. So like I mentioned earlier, she wrote a book. It was fairly successful. She tells people that she doesn't want to write a second book. Secretly, she's writing a second book. And this book is called The Shadow of the Third, and it is a terrible book. It is really just no good. There's, in my mind, almost nothing to redeem it as a piece of literature by itself. For the most part, it is concerned with retelling plot points from Anna's life that we already know about or will know about quite soon in more detail. She changes the names. All the characters from Free Women are here as well, just with different names. Um, 
It's just a fictionalized Anna walking around thinking about the same things that Anna is thinking about throughout all the other notebooks, just saying it over and over, and then Anna will come in and analyze her own novel, telling us exactly, you know, how it relates to her life, if, you know, in case we haven't figured it out already. It's, it's an interesting idea to have a character in your novel write a novel. You know, it's a it's a way, you know, of expressing something about the character. I just don't think it works here because it's way too long. It's like a hundred pages of the book are concerned with this fake novel. And it's not good. It's no fun to read, you know. It's kind of interesting to see, but it's not worth all the time it takes up in the novel. Everything that is here in the Yellow Notebook is also stated later in the blue notebook, which is her diaries. At the end of the yellow notebook, we do get a series of ideas for short stories that Anna is sort of writing down. These short stories reveal something about Anna, which is her complete lack of imagination. And this is part of her struggles of writing in general, is that she's stuck in this communist way of thinking she needs to write stories that are have important themes for the betterment of the working class or you know the revolutionization of the world um however when she actually sits down to write all she wants to write about is her own dang self doing the same things and these short story ideas are just a woman meets a man the man is a bad man he has a wife but the woman falls in love with the man, and then it ends and they're all sad and, and you know, whatever. <clears throat> that part is at least interesting in that it reveals to us Ina's uh, lack of imagination. However, overall, the yellow notebook is just really long and kind of redundant, you know. And it really encapsulate, encapsulates uh, the overall feeling I have about this book, which is simply that while it is interesting, there is way too much in it, uh, and way too much repetitiveness. Um, so moving on to the Blue Notebook. This is, I'd say the Blue Notebook, in terms of the page count, it is the most substantial. It's about 150 pages, um, as compared to Free Women, which is about 145. Um, and it is a pretty the least structured of the one. It is just Anna's diary. It's just, you know, what, you know, things that have happened to her, boop, 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 boop. Primarily just a lot of introspec introspection? Introspection? No. Introspection. Uh, ah, uh, what's going on with me? I feel this way. I feel that way. Doop, 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 doop. You know, beep, bop, alula. There are several extraneous scenes where she meets characters from Free Women, um, from her perspective, but those characters, as I'll talk about in a second, are no good and not very fun, so those parts are kind of a wash. There's a lot of her going to a psycho and a psychoanalyst um, and arguing with her psychoanalyst, and then they analyze her dreams a lot. Personally, I can't say anything about a book concerned with dreams, since I also wrote a book uh, primarily concerned with someone's dreams. So I will move on from that. Though I'll say it's made me think a lot about whether I should ever do that again, considering uh, how I felt about reading about Anna's dreams in this book. The, the Blue Notebook, sort of, the main thing that happens is kind of near the end. Regarding Anna's relationships with men, so she has um, this sort of ex-boyfriend who she writes about in the yellow notebook who she didn't like and she got together with him anyway and then they were together for three years and then he said, I'm going to leave you a billion times and then eventually he left her because he had a wife. Um, and she's very put out by this. You know, she considers this a great misfortune towards her. And... 
she kind of just keeps getting involved with men like this. And it's difficult to read because it's a, you're reading a first-person account of someone making clear mistakes that they seem to know that they're doing it, and yet they don't stop. And this is culminates in this final relationship she has with an American man who moves into a, her apartment. Uh, she has a, she, a flat. Sorry, this is England, so she lives in a flat. And a man lets the room, or rents the room in her flat, and then they have a relationship, uh, you could call it. It's a very difficult passage to read. It's about, I think, like 40 or 50 pages. It's very clear immediately that this guy sucks. He's a complete dumbass. He's a misogynist. He pretends to be self-aware, but is just being a dick to everyone, etc., etc. Um, and they get into this mutually abusive, shitty relationship with each other. And you're reading the first person account and you're just like, stop it. You know, it's like, just stop already, you know? But obviously, it's, it, it is realistic because this happens, you know. People do get involved in these relationships and they don't know how to stop. And so while it is frustrating to read, it is interesting in a way. Um, it does feel a bit exaggerated. Like, I don't know. The guy is a real piece of work, you know? Anna is also a real piece of work, though. Um, so I guess they make a certain amount of sense. Thankfully, eventually that relationship ends. Um, though not with. None of them seem to have learned anything from the experience. Um, I guess I'll talk about the way. Free Women, uh, the novella, relates to Anna and this blue notebook, which is the most substantial part. I did write notes, by the way, for this uh, review, but the, the things I'm trying to talk about, it's so complicated trying to talk about this book because it's really all, all over the place. So uh, that's why I'm fumbling about quite a lot. But I do have notes. They're right there. They're on, this, they're on my screen, at least. Anyway. Free, free Women. Let's talk about the novella Free Women. It's not very um, good, I don't think. I think that the only reason it's here is to provide a sort of reason for the book to exist at all. You can't... I guess Doris Lessing felt that she couldn't just put out a book that was just a bunch of diaries of a woman named Anna. She had to have something that sort of framed it as if it was a real story and that's what free women attempts to do but the the characters i mean anna's presence in free women is kind of nothing you know she doesn't she she talks to people but she doesn't have an active role in the story everyone else in the story they're all mean spirited very, their conversations are just pithy jabs at each other, and they're also shallow, you know. And the book, the novella is only about 150 pages, so there's not really, you don't get to go into them very much, which explains the shallowness, but they each have about, you know, one thing they want to do. They're trying to manipulate everyone else to let them do this thing, and at the end, they all just sort of give up and do what, whatever they want. And they all just do the stupidest thing imaginable. And then it's like, ah, man, you know, oh, well. Sort of free women, uh, if we were to, you know, try to parse some sort of theme that it provides for Anna's story, is it is it an expression of this dis disillusionment that we've talked about with the communism, uh, the sort of loss of her ideals, because all the characters have ideals they have things they want to happen and they want to make the world follow that and then at the end they all just give up and it's sort of like ah man what are you going to do so to zoom out now 
and talk about the book as a, as a whole, like I just talked about in with Free Women, the characters are no good. You, you, none of these people have any humanity. There's no brightness to their humanity. There's no character to them. They're all just people in situations, and they're all kind of mean-spirited. Their conversations are insufferable, you know? They're just jabbing at each other, and, you know, Anna will say this, and then she'll think, oh, he thought I was going to say this, and now he's thinking to say this, and I'll say that instead, (laughs) haha, you know? And it's like, you kind of get, it's kind of like a Hegel, you're being reflected all over the place, and you you lose track of, like, no one actually talks, nobody actually thinks about conversations in this way, I don't think. I mean, I hope not. Um, so these conversations are, are crazy. Tommy, the, the son, like, sort of becomes this malevolent god figure that everyone is afraid of halfway through the book, and it's just bizarre, like, weird, you know? Overall, the book is incredibly cynical. Um, there are jokes, or you could call them jokes. There are sequences that are not serious, but they are not serious in a way that is mocking. They're always mocking something. They're not, you know, trying to have fun. It's just mocking something. So these jokes don't bring any levity to the story. It's just bleh the whole time. However, the cynicism, this disillusionment, it does feel genuine. It feels sincere, as if, you know, the author was has tried to see the good and just failed to do so, I guess. It seems like Anna's story of being so caught up in the awfulness of the world and the inability to change it, um... It's like a result of this striving to change and then realizing your inadequacy and then not really knowing what to do with yourself. So I do think the book is very genuine and it it, in, it very rarely falls into cliche. And if it does fall into cliche, it does feel aware of it. It feels like it has something to say about the cliches that it brings up. It's a... Sorry, it, it portrays some sort of reality. It is not a reality that I know, um, but it does um, seem to reflect some sort of reality. I've never been a woman in 1950s England, but I can imagine that the sort of pressures that she feels um, are uh, uh, representative of the way many women felt and do feel to this day. And I think I I did learn a lot, Um, I think, reading, especially the segments about her um, and her relationship with her daughter, and uh, the way she thinks of her life, and the way she de- sort of devotes it to her daughter, in a, in a sense. I found that, that pretty interesting. As far as the uh, her relationship with men, the, all the men in this book just suck. They're all like children, and very stupid, um, and misogynistic, but like in a really weird, like, s- pretending to be self-aware, but still just being a dickhead sort of way. Which is not unrealistic, I think. You know, I think, I'm sure if I went out and tried to date men, I'd f- find a lot of people like that. So, you know, fair enough. The The book is, is messy. Um, as you can see by this review, which is messy, the the book is all over the place. You're you're really going back and forth. Um, there's not really a clear through line. So when I was finished, I really had to spend a lot of time thinking about what it was that the book was actually about. And so while I didn't enjoy reading it, and I wouldn't call it a book that I like, it was particularly. I don't know why I said particularly. It was pretty thought-provoking. You know, I had a lot of thoughts reading this book, and I think it's a very interesting book, and it is a very successful expression of what she was trying to express, albeit a little bit too long, uh, maybe could have been squeezed together, could have had a bit more um, 
thought put into how certain things relate, but easier said than done, I think. So a lot of a lot of books I dislike and I think, oh well that was just stupid. This one I think I dislike, but it, it was it's pretty interesting. Uh, there's certainly nothing else I've read that is like this one, so I can't recommend reading it. However, if you want to think about it, you're going to have to read about it. Read it. Um, so I don't know what to say to you. Um, that's the golden notebook. Uh, I've gone through all my notes now, so and I've also lost my voice. Um, so I guess that means the review is over. Thank you uh, for being around. Goodbye.